Hello. We'll make a start. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Cecile Huey from the uh, European Commission. Hello. Uh, thank you, Barry. So, so uh, welcome, everybody. So we co-organized this, uh, this workshop uh, together with Barry uh, to help you uh, and, and provide you information about the activities in Europe about AI. So uh, Barry, being a representative of your AI, has, uh, has helped a lot also in, in helping us uh, during the, the, the preparation. So the goal of this um, of this session is to present you the, the strategy we have developed for AI and then also present the different activities. So uh, Barry will mention also uh, what is done in URAI, other workshop we have organized together, and also the, uh, the high-level group uh, we, are, uh, we have selected to, to help us in the strategy, so as a member of that, he will explain you a bit uh, his experience uh, in, in that. Uh, and then we will have two presentations from our uh, public-private partnership uh, related to AI, so one on uh, big data and one in, in robotics, which have a, a big stake in AI, so to, uh, they will have a chance to explain the service they offer to the community and how uh, to interact with you. So, thank you, Barry. Uh, I will first start with a, a, a presentation. It will maybe a bit, be a bit long, but we have many things to, uh, to report to you and to inform you about. So, uh, I'll try to be uh, as interesting and, and concise as possible, but there is quite a lot of information. So, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, working at the Commission in, uh, uh, so our unit is robotics and AI, so we've been funding uh, robotics and AI for, uh, oh, we created the unit in 2004, so for a number of years now, and uh, so until quite recently we were focusing on, on funding, but now we are also developing policy for AI, and this is uh, the content of my talk. So uh, I will present the uh, AI strategy for Europe we came up uh, with. Uh, and then I will uh, talk about the European AI Alliance you've heard about already uh, in the previous panel. And uh, very interesting for you as well is the AI funding in the Horizon 2020 program. So I will mention a few elements which are key for, uh, for AI and where we expect you to contribute as, as the scientist, as the community, uh, delivering the result on AI, the science and the technology. Uh, so, yeah, different aspect of that. And I will also give you a few uh, insights about what we're going to do after Horizon 2020, so our proposal that we are now going to discuss also with uh, the, the member states, the, the, uh, uh, also the, 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 the Parliament and the Council. So, first of all, the strategy of AI, you are part of the community, so how can you be part of it? What are we doing in this, uh, in this strategy? So, our goal is to really maximize the benefits from AI because we, for sure, this will have an economic impact and we want the economic impact to be also in Europe. We, were, we want our economy, our industry, or citizens to benefit from that. So this is one of the goals. And the other uh, aspect is we want our citizens uh, to, to uh, benefit from all the potential AI can offer in, in various aspects of our life, be it in the healthcare system, energy efficiency, road safety, cybersecurity. Okay, as expert in the field, I don't have to explain you all the potential benefit AI can bring. Uh, but this is quite challenging. Uh, for Europe, uh, one of the challenges we have is uh, we have uh, strong researchers and uh, engineers, but we have to stay at the forefront uh, of uh, science and technology, and the competition is fierce. So, so we have to do something about that. Access to data is very important uh, in, in AI, so uh, also uh, 
in, 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 in view of what's happening in other parts of the world, how can we make sure so we, we provide data to, uh, to scientists, to engineers, to companies uh, to grow in the field. Uh, we want AI to be inclusive, so we don't want to create a split and only uh, the top level uh, scientist or, or expert can uh, use the technology. We really want to uh, not to create a divide, so we want to be inclusive to make sure that the technology is usable and affordable for everybody. We also know that the labor landscape will change and we have to adapt to that. We have to, uh, to, to assess what are the change and then to, to anticipate those. And uh, one of the aspects is, is the skill uh, that we have to develop, uh, both for the developers of the technology, but also for the users, make sure that uh, the, everyone can use the technology. Acceptance, ethical issues, so uh, people are not always informed and they are, they are scared about the technology and there are ethical issues, so what can we do to make sure uh, that these are uh, addressed? And safety and liability issue, the more autonomous the systems are, uh, the more question about, uh, the, the more risk about safety, how can we handle that? How can we make sure that uh, systems are inherently safe? And then in terms of liability also, we have to understand uh, what is at stake. If a, a a system makes a mistake, who is liable? And uh, our big challenge in Europe is uh, the effort we have are too much scattered. So uh, in view of the uh, international competition where you have those huge centers with uh, huge investment, so how can we uh, compete? Our strengths, as also highlighted in the previous uh, panel, uh, so we have excellent research centre, excellent researchers, we find them uh, everywhere in the world, the top labs have European researchers, and we also see uh, uh, you know, international companies having their labs in Europe because they want also to have access to our research. Uh, we are very strong in some of the uh, industry, in particular robotics, and uh, so this is one of the strengths of Europe to uh, how can we capitalize on this robotic strength which also embed uh, intelligence and AI. So we have to capitalize on this and how can both robotics and AI benefit from each other. Uh, and then we are also strong in B2B domain. So for sure uh, B2C is, uh, we are less strong but let's capitalize on what we have and our strengths in B2B. Uh, we are also strong in some of the industrial sectors uh, such as automotive, healthcare and agri-food which can benefit greatly from the, uh, the current state of AI and the future. So uh, how to bring AI in those sectors so that they can, they can grow and become more competitive. And we also have industrial data, public service data, but also industrial data. How can we make them available in a way which also respects our, our value? So this is why we developed this strategy, because it's, uh, we find it important to join forces at European level. And uh, we have many ingredients. So how to get our act together to make it happen and to make AI for good and for people and for everybody. Uh, so, we have three pillars on our uh, strategy. We need to address not only the technology, the investment, but uh, so this is the first pillar, really to boost the, uh, our capacity in technology and science, and also to help the take up of the technology in any application and businesses and processes. But we also have to address the other aspect, the non-technological aspect, such as uh, the, uh, the socio-economic change in terms of labor market, how to adapt to it. And finally, we also have to make sure that we have the proper ethical and legal framework uh, for that. So regarding the investment, as also uh, mentioned before, we are really increasing our uh, annual investment by 70% uh, of our annual investment in the coming year. Uh, and also our target is to uh, reach beyond uh, 2020. Then in the next decade, we would ha like to have a 20 billion investment per year in Europe. Uh, so we want to mobilize uh, also the private sector and the member states to make the same effort as the one we make. So, so that together we reach 20 billion uh, per year uh, in, in Europe. Um, 
So regarding the second pillar, preparing the socio-economic challenges, uh, uh, for so, uh, socio-economic challenges and, and, and the change of the job landscape, so we want to anticipate those changes, see what we can do to, to, uh, to get prepared for that. We want also to make effort to uh, make sure that the workforce has the right skill to do it. But it's not only this. We, from a technology point of view, we have also to make sure that the technology is easy to use. So this is also a research issue that we have to address. And finally, we have also to, uh, regarding the talents, to create the talents in Europe, give the right skill to the developers, and uh, also make sure that, okay, the, the, the bright people stay in Europe and we have an attractive uh, framework to, to, uh, to, to attract them uh, in, in Europe. So, the third pillar I mentioned is the ethical and legal framework, so we have to make sure that the system, the way they are developed, the way they are used, respect our fundamental value in Europe, and this is one of the strengths of Europe. And uh, in order to do that, first of all, in the, in the legal framework, we are assessing whether the current legal framework is uh, still for, fit for, for purpose for, uh, given the evolution of the technology, given that we have uh, more autonomy in systems. So, for instance, the product liability directive is under revision and, and to, to see how, uh, if it's still uh, fit for purpose, the same for machine directive and so on. So th these are uh, efforts we do in the legal side. In the ethical side, uh, we cannot, Brussels cannot uh, decide on its own. It's so important to have every stakeholder involved to decide the type of AI we want in, in Europe in the future. This is why we have created a framework to have a, a forum involving every stakeholder in, in this discussion to decide about the future of, uh, of uh, Europe in AI and the ethical aspect in particular. And for that, we also selected a, a, a group of uh, high-level experts, which helps us. They are representative of the community. Uh, we, we had a call for experts, and then we selected them to make sure not only that they are uh, top-level experts, but they are representative of the various type of stakeholders, be it industry, academia, and uh, civil society, but the different sectors are, are also represented. So this is very important, and they will help us to uh, come up with ethical guidelines by uh, the, uh, the end of the year, and they will be uh, finalized uh, early next year. And the goal of these guidelines is not to come with, again, new principles, but to make uh, the, some of the most important uh, principles operational for companies uh, to, to implement them. So that's, that's the work we're ongoing. Regarding joint forces, we have to join forces at all levels. So it's not only to bring all the stakeholders together, but also bring the different member states together. So, uh, and for that, we have a very strong support from, from member states. So uh, all the member states and Norway have now signed the declaration uh, of cooperation on AI. So that, that's very important. And then we work uh, together and by the end of the year we also want to have a, a, a coordinated plan uh, with the member states to see how we can uh, go ahead uh, in AI so we will decide on ways uh, member states can cooperate, define common priorities and so on for the future uh, of AI. So uh, now regarding the European AI Alliance, so uh, as Khalil said before, you are strongly invited to contribute to it. So in order to implement, help us implement the strategy to, uh, to define the priority, more fine-grained priorities for the future, the policies, the investment, the ethical uh, aspects. So we want to have a multi-stakeholder forum bringing together all the different types of stakeholders. So we want to have this joint reflection about the future of AI in Europe, and we want to really to mobilize the, uh, the, the stakeholders. So, this is uh, why we're strongly inviting you to join the Alliance and make your voice heard. So it's a way to get your uh, contribution, to, to have an influence uh, about the future. And then we are supported by this high-level expert group on AI. They will also uh, be an interface between us and the Alliance because this is a tool they can use also to ask some specific question to define the guidelines of ethics, to define the, the, uh, the, the policy uh, for the future and so on. So 
in the, in the longer run, we would like to make this uh, European AI Alliance really a reference platform to think, to reflect about the future of AI. So, some more information about the Alliance. So, here is the address and uh, you can uh, log into it and register to it. Uh, this is very simple, it's open to everybody. You just have to explain, okay, what's your interest on AI and then you will have access. You will see a bit, this is the way it, work, it, it looks like. And then you see you have different, uh, yes, that works, uh, different parts you have uh, about it, just explaining what it is. You have blog posts you can react to and this is also where the experts will ask some questions. So they will need to get your opinion about some of the aspects and this is the way, uh, your way to influence it. There, there will be a forum so where everybody can, can discuss some topics. We have some documents here, which is more the official documents like the national strategies and, and or official documents like the communication, so you will find them there. An open library where yourself can upload also interesting documents which you want to share with the, with the community. Events, so for instance, today's events is listed there, so if you have interesting event to communicate you can also uh, put it there. Uh, AI high-level group, you can see there uh, the, uh, the, the 52 uh, experts who, who have been selected for the AI level group, so, uh, and, and they will interact as well with you through the, this platform. And people, these are all the, uh, the people who registered, and yesterday we reached 1,000 of people on the platform. So uh, that's, that's good to see the, the interest uh, of people. Uh, so, uh, so that's, that's uh, the, uh, the, the platform and so I hope by tomorrow we, we will double the number with your participation. Okay, I'm just exaggerating a bit. So no, important for everyone, so maybe people asleep will, will wake up, we are talking about money. Uh, so some of the people before said we need to invest more, we need to invest more, so I will try to explain you a bit more concretely what we are funding. So we are displaying those big numbers, but where is it concretely? Where can you find uh, your way of, uh, of, of being part of it and, and uh, getting funded for doing your research? We need you to do the research to achieve the, project, the progress we need uh, uh, on, on AI as well. So a first tool we have, so this is a project, uh, a call we had already in the past, and it's under evaluation, so the result will be published uh, on the 9th of August. This is the European on-demand platform. I will not go into the detail, but the, the, the goal of that is to gather un under the same big platform, an umbrella, if you wish, integrate all the sources, uh, the resources and the tool we already have in Europe. So many good labs are producing excellent results, but they are scattered again. So the idea here is to have a, a one access point to all the resources. So as a researcher, so we will invite, the project will invite everybody to produce, to put their results uh, and, and uh, uh, link them to the, uh, to the platform, make it available to the platform. And, um, the goal is also to offer solution and support to all potential users of AI and so that they can use all those resources in their application product and services. So it's, it's a tool for the researchers as, as well to find resources, to find algorithms, to find data, to find compute power and so on. So this should really be a hub where the AI community uh, join and, and it's served by, by, by the, the platform. So this is a bit how it looks like. So we would uh, bring under the platform all the software, the prototypes, the data we already have. We will build on top of that a layer of service which is extremely important to bridge the gap between the provider of the technology, between the provider of the software, the tools, the robotic uh, component and so on, and the potential users because they might not be aware of what the technology can do for them or not every SME can afford to have an AI expert. So we need this interim layer uh, to have good engineer, good integrator, who understand at the same time the offer and, and the demand uh, from the user. So it must be a, a both way direction because it will also uh, create a demand for new, uh, new challenges for research and so on. So it's a driver for research, but also an opportunity to exploit the ex existing research result. So this was the AI on demand platform. The call has been published. We will fund one big project, 20 million euro project. 
and this should be the, the, the place to be. This should integrate and be a federator of all the uh, researcher, the research community in, in Europe. So we hope you will interact with the, uh, with the platform. We will come back uh, to that in the future as well. Another tool we have is Digital Innovation Hub. So I will try to explain you uh, this concept. Uh, some of them call it differently, but this is a concept that our commissioner uh, uh, presented a few, a few uh, years ago. And his goal was to really help every company to uh, help them in their digital transformation. So it's not only targeted to AI, it's any digital uh, technology. How can we help every company to, uh, to make their, their digital transformation? So uh, the goal is to have in every region a center, an ecosystem which will help the local uh, economy to benefit from the technology, to uh, benefit from digitization. And so it's, it's very much rooted in regional activity, so it's the, the, the local uh, government and authorities have already invested in good competence center and so on, so this builds on that. And, but we want also really at EU level to help that and we top up uh, these existing activities with uh, we committed to, uh, to spend uh, half a billion on these activity in Horizon 2020 and I will explain a bit more what it is concretely. So a digital innovation hub is typically uh, developed around the competence center which brings the knowledge from the researcher, from the technologist this brings also some support in terms of technical support to develop prototype, integrate uh, technology into uh, products and, and so on. It offers some infrastructure, it depends on the type of activity you're doing, but you might need some compute uh, uh, power, you might need some robotics, uh, uh, you know, prototyping, some robotics platform to test your technology, and so on. So this is a, a, a resource the, 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 the Digital Innovation Hub brings. Testing facility, so having also access to user to understand the user needs. Uh, access to finance, it's not only about technology, but the whole uh, business model, so you need access to finance, training to train the potential user of the technology how to use it and also to make people aware of the, the, what the technology uh, can offer, how to use it. Innovation coaching, so again, not only technology but also developing new business startups and so on. So the Digital Innovation Hub is somehow a broker between the users, the suppliers, the investors, so to, to, to get, this is what we call the um, ecosystem. And you build them locally, so it's usually built around this competence center, bringing the local academia, entrepreneurs around, incubators, industry, investors, user community, being citizens, SMEs, local economic actors, and governments. And the goal is again to bring them together. And this is a hub which is a center of uh, a network which brings the complementarity of the different actors. And this happens locally, so you have these local digital innovation hubs, but you cannot have in every region a digital innovation hub expert in all the technology. So this is why they need to develop their local ecosystem, but work with other digital innovation hubs located somewhere else in Europe so that they complement in terms either on value chain, where you bring a technology which is used somewhere else, but also in terms of technology complementarity. So you might be an expert uh, 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 digital innovation hub in robotics, but need some uh, expertise in photonics or in simulation, and then you will work with other ones so that uh, all together uh, you Will, you will bring the necessary elements you need for your local ecosystem. So it's really a local one-stop shop for expertise, complementarity, and specialization. And we have identified, so we have a catalog of uh, the uh, Digital Innovation Hub in Europe. So we have collected, uh, so, so it's, it's, uh, it's a collection of people having um, uh, registered to the catalog, so we check whether uh, they're uh, in, in which category they are, and these are the ones related to uh, AI. So we still need to 
reassess how far they are or expert they are if, because some of them claim to be expert in everything, that's not possible. So we will have to reassess and retune that, but at least we have some uh, important uh, activity in, in, in some areas in Europe. So now to make the link, so this was about digital innovation hubs. So what we fund at European level, it's the networking among the uh, different digital innovation hubs. So this is where we add the European added value, and this is where we put our money, while the local activity is funded locally. Uh, and we hope our goal is to uh, bring our funding in the uh, AI on demand platform and make it distributed via the network of digital innovation hubs. So there will be a need to close collaboration between the digital innovation hubs and, and the uh, AI on demand platform. So we have this kind of toolbox. The AI on demand platform is the central toolbox, if I wish, but it's, it's not necessarily a central uh, physical location, but it means that it's a one uh, stop shop to get access to the technology. And then we, we have also the network of the uh, digital innovation hub. It's the distribution channel in every region. So now, how about the future core? So what I try to do here, and uh, it's, it's to, to give you a bit more concrete information. Where you're working in AI, where can you apply for funding? So as I said, we will increase our, uh, as, yeah, as of this year, our investment in AI by 70% uh, uh, per year. And we have already identified in the strategy some of the uh, areas we want to focus on. So we continue to uh, fund basic and industrial research, uh, either technology per se or used in some of the, or societal challenge as we identify them, so health, transport, agriculture, manufacturing, and so on. In addition, we have uh, this AI on demand platform, so a first, an initial funding will happen this year. The project should start early next year, uh, but there will be another funding round in 2020 for this. Uh, the uh, Digital Innovation Hub Network, so we have already uh, we are going to fund for 64 million euro this year, uh, Digital Innovation Hub in robotics, uh, but there will be later call as well relevant for, uh, for AI, such as in, in, in big data. Uh, so, but we want to identify already, even if we don't fund them, the Digital Innovation Hubs uh, related to AI existing in Europe. And then we also want to invest in strengthening AI excellence centers. So this is another activity which will come in 2020. And regarding data, we want to uh, also uh, invest in, in uh, making data available. So we want to create an industrial data platform. Uh, so what I've tried to do is, is to extract from all the uh, programs we have at the Commission, uh, being in, uh, so we have big pillars. So we have a scientific part, which is open to all the, uh, the type of uh, uh, domain, scientific domain being uh, AI, but it, it's also open to biology and, and the material science and so on. So we have an open part. We also have a second pillar, which is more targeted to, uh, to technology. So it's really pushing the technology. And the third pillar is about societal challenge. So it's more application driven to solve some, some societal challenge. And the second pillar is light. So uh, leadership in enabling uh, technology. And uh, this is where uh, I, I showed the, uh, the oh, sorry, oops, uh, the highest share of money go in the first one, so 45, more than 45% of the budget invested in AI. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's in, the, in this pillar, so uh, uh, this uh, enabling technology. Uh, so so we, we still invest in developing the technology. So for that, we fund either research and innovation projects or more application driven, so innovation uh, project we call them. Uh, and then uh, the second uh, most important uh, part where we are funding uh, AI is actually the, uh, the open part. And here it's an extrapolation of what we have been funding in the open part in the past. So uh, being uh, excellence in science via the ERC, so European Research Council, uh, being SME uh, projects, so these are uh, called targeted for SMEs uh, and so on. So 
if we extrapolate what we've been funding in the past in AI in those open call, um, I don't think it will go lower given the importance we have in AI. So uh, we will have quite a lot of funding in, those, in, in this open part. So look at this part. And then we go to societal challenge. So in transport, we, we are also funding uh, autonomous driving and, and so on. So the, the, there is uh, some money there. Uh, and MVP, I will come back to that. It's material science, manufacturing and so on. Healthcare. We are also spending quite a bit of money in healthcare, space research, fed future and emerging technology. So this is uh, uh, yes, uh, specific also to, uh, to, to more research activities. Uh, food, uh, medicine, climate security, and so on. So I'll, I'll go very quickly now to uh, the, the most uh, important uh, call. So what I've done here, I went through the whole work program and extracted the title which are relevant for where there is a component on AI. And uh, I highlighted here the call open in, uh, in 2019. So these are the call open in the coming year. And so, so that, I mean, I will give you access to all the, uh, uh, the presentation is quite long, but at least I highlighted the keywords you can relate to. And I asked all the colleagues in the different service to provide a bit more information about each of these topics. It's not complete yet, but you have a fair bit of information already about that. And we have what we call a participant portal. And if you go in this portal, you will find more information about that, that call. I did not give information about the calls uh, mentioned 2020 because uh, this will be the final text nor budget ha have not been decided yet and this information will be made available early next year. So that's, that's something to come after. But at least already now you can see how you can get prepared for the coming call in the coming year. So we have activities in manufacturing, in robotics, two calls on robotics, one more applied, one more, more uh, research oriented. We have activities in high performance computing and big data doing large scale test bed. Uh, we also have uh, here on, on data as well, uh, data market and, and data economy, extreme scale demonstrator, again, a link to, to, uh, to data and, and uh, high, high performance computing. And we also have activities in next generation uh, uh, of uh, internet. So some of these, as, these calls are not specific to AI, but have a big share on AI. So it's uh, to some degree, different calls have different uh, uh, focus or different uh, share on, on AI. Uh, the same thing now, it's in digital technology. One of our, our uh, sub uh, heading is digital technology. This is where we fund, for instance, Digital Innovation Hub. And here we have again a focus on manufacturing, manufacturing again, uh, agriculture is an important topic, smart home and smart grid. Uh, we also have uh, big data for energy. So these are, if you're working on this area, have a closer look to the calls. In healthcare now, so this is more applied research in the context of the societal challenge healthcare. And here we have different also uh, foci in our research, so monitoring aspect after cancer treatment, uh, health and care, uh, and personalized, yeah, personalized health care is very important. And here, smart and healthy uh, living at home, so how can the technology help people to, to stay longer independent at home? And also the active and assisted living program has some activity related to AI. In terms of transport, I mentioned some of the uh, activity we do. So again, here, an automated uh, vehicle, either human-centered or in, in urban environment. Transport, we also do uh, uh, freight by water, so uh, multimodal uh, also transport. We have drones, we have logistics, interconnected transport. In food processing, we also have aquaculture, agri-food, uh, food, uh, food and agriculture are our key, uh, key topics also, where AI can add value. Space, we also have those big data from, coming from space, so how can we uh, foster uh, uh, also uh, use AI in, in this domain. And this one is the one I mentioned before about uh, material science, about advanced manufacturing, and again here, uh, AI can play a role either in handling flexible materials, so it's closer to robotics again, cognitive production plans, and also characterization of materials based on, on modeling and, and using AI. So in climate, 
earth observation, use for mining, and uh, well-being in health and city. These are things uh, uh, called this year security, either physical security, uh, where you, uh, you, we monitor a border and external security, but also cybercrime and terrorism are also more the, on, on the cyber, on, on, on the software side. Uh, inclusive society, it is here to see how AI can be used in public services uh, or also help in policy making. So it's not only to deliver better services to citizens, but also to see how big data, for instance, can be used for policy making. So these are, again, some activities. Now it's more, again, on the physical side. So in, uh, we have what we call joint, joint undertaking is a kind of uh, public-private partnership as well. And so we have different ones with different foci. One of them is on the electronic component and uh, there is a clear uh, also uh, interest for AI in this domain. Uh, and also we have a joint undertaking in uh, innovative medicine initiative. And again, as you know, uh, AI can definitely play an interesting role there and the contribution. We are also working on HPC, so high performance computing. So uh, we are developing an infrastructure there which can be also used uh, for, for AI for sure. So future and emerging technology, we have some part of it which are open and some are part of it which are targeted so you can look more into the detail of that. Other open scheme, I mentioned European Research Council, this is a very selective, uh, really high level um, uh, research and, and uh, very top level uh, scientists you have there so uh, you can look as an individual or as a group of researchers there. SME instruments, if you are an SME there are different stages of funding you can also benefit from and Marie Curie it's more for the PhD student to, uh, to collaborate with the other. So what you will see in, in, in the next slide which is a long set of slides it's more detail about each of those topics. So I will not go through them, but you will have access to the slides. And so now I go back to oops, this. So that was the last type of... Uh, so you see in, in ERC there is 1.9 billion euro a year uh, in, in ERC. So there is a lot of money there. It's extremely selective because you are compared to any kind of other science, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's worth uh, trying and uh, top level scientists, we have top level scientists uh, funded through this uh, system and there are different sub scheme, but you, if you're interested, I let you go into more detail. No, so that's, that's for the coming call. So we will have those different types of instruments. So research and innovation plus the, the, the platform plus the digital innovation hubs. These are the main type of project. And after, so what are we going to do after Horizon 2020? So we have what we call the next multi-annual uh, financial framework. We have a proposal and I will tell you a bit more uh, what we have in that proposal so that you can also see the longer term vision and how, how you can be prepared for that. So we uh, have highlighted here uh, what are the digital aspects in the future uh, program, so in, in our proposal. So we have two parts. So one is the normal if you want the direct continuation of Horizon 2020, this is called digital, uh, the uh, uh, Horizon Europe uh, program, where we will still continue funding research and innovation uh, similar to what we do, uh, plus some, some innovation as well, like uh, access to finance and so on. And the digital part in this big pillar uh, is 100 uh, mil billion euro, and 15 billion go directly to, uh, to this uh, uh, pillar here, global challenge on digital and industry cluster. So this, this is 15 uh, billion euro. And within that, AI and robotics is an important pillar. So this is where uh, this uh, AI and robotics lies in, in the Horizon Europe. Now there is a new program where uh, we, we have proposed a new program called Digital Europe. And the goal of that program is uh, to build our capacity, to fund a strong uh, capacity here in key technologies such as HPC, AI, and cybersecurity. So these are the three 
priority we put in the program. So capacity building and deployment. So this is really the focus. It's a, it's a more advanced, more uh, closer to deployment, but this is very important to, uh, to, to fund these areas. They, are, they were identified for priority. And underlying those, there are two uh, activities. One is about uh, advanced digital skills and the digital skills will address those three technologies. So we want to uh, help uh, skilling, giving the right skill to the people in these three uh, in technology. And the, th the last one, it's really the deployment. So this is where we will fund the similar type of activity we do in digital innovation hubs. And this will also help in bringing the technology to the administration, to the public sector. So this, this is in a nutshell, the, uh, the future program. And more specifically, in terms of funding, so you see uh, HPC 2.7 billion, AI 2.5 billion, we will have here, and cybersecurity here. So these are the three technology and underlying effort in skills, uh, 700 million, and digital transformation and interoperability, this is about deployment. So this is, in a nutshell, the, uh, the, the, our proposal for the Digital Europe program, building the capacity and uh, making deployment happening. Uh, so more into the detail what we want to do in the AI part, we see three big pillars. One is uh, really uh, so going along the continuation of the AI on demand platform. Here it's uh, to give access and, uh, to data and algorithms. So all the resources we are embedding in our AI on demand platform, here it's more geared towards deployment. So, so they have to be probably more advanced than, than what we have current, we will have at the beginning on the AI on demand platform. So it's, it's less targeted to researcher, but more to, uh, to provide tools to, to people who will deploy the technology. But we want to have still continuous this, this part of the repository under the Digital Europe program. And then we also have to um, yeah, bring the power of AI to business and public administration. This, is, this will be done uh, in collaboration also with Digital Innovation Hub. And we want to have a very strong uh, testing and experimentation facility, so reference centers, it does not have to be hundreds of them, but few big centers connected together, working together to really uh, help in the deployment. So making the, uh, the large scale testing which are needed before we can deploy. And once there would be those specialized centers, and once the technology will be uh, developed and will be fully tested, then they can be deployed to everybody. So the, the goal here is not to repeat the same testing everywhere in Europe, but to have those specialized and more advanced uh, reference center which can fully test the technology and then when uh, they, they, they will have an expertise and they will have to share it to all the uh, other potential users in the future. So that's the uh, uh, the, the Digital Europe program, and as I said, uh, there will be strong interaction with the, uh, with the skills part. So the arrow you were right, Reiner, they should go in both directions. And the same here is this uh, deployment uh, part of the Digital Europe program. So this is all for me. Thank you for your attention. We will take question after the session, but now I will invite Barry to come and present his uh, activity in Europe. Here it is. Yes. Sorry. And then next registration. And this is it. Okay, I won't take very much time. Um, so um, I, I just want to give you a sense of what URI has been doing with uh, Cecile um, and the others at TG Connect over the last few months. Um, so first of all, most of you know what URI is, but for those of you who don't, um, it's one of the largest AI associations in the world. Um, it's an association of associations, so there are national associations that are members of URI. And I suppose if you, if you express it in terms of the number of members who are 
in, a number of individuals who have a membership of URAI th through their national association. There are about 4,500 members across 30 countries. Um, one of the things that uh, Cecile mentioned was this, this high-level expert group. So a number of us, are, a number of URAI people are on that. So Francesco Rossi, who's here, is a member. I'm a member. Virginia Dignam, who was here earlier, is a member. And there are two things that, that this group is doing. It's basically interacting with this uh, AI alliance that Cecile mentioned. And it is creating the set of ethical guidelines. And it's uh, deciding on the um, funding policy for Europe in the in the sort of post H 2020 uh, scenario. So I suppose um, you know, we're very open to hearing what people think about this sort of thing. Um, the group is really sort of steering that AI, that AI alliance rather than um, rather than sort of being executive in, in a sense. Um, <clears throat> so Cecile mentioned this AI alliance, which you've already heard of. So I'll just pass. I'll just move along. Um, I suppose in January, URI started working, um, well, last September we started working with the European Commission, um, trying to introduce, I suppose, what, what URI was doing, what the member organizations were about, um, what opportunities there were for URI to collaborate with the Commission. And so one of the things we did was establish a workshop in January of 2018, where we invited all of the member associations um, a member state representative of government and a representative member um, from industry. So there was essentially a sort of a tripartite um, approach to this. And so the purpose of this was really for the, the presidents or chair people of the uh, associations to come and tell the commission what they were doing, in the, what was happening in AI in their own country. So what was their national conference all about? Was there a national strategy in AI? Um, and it, it was pretty well attended, so I'll speak to that and I'll actually give you a sense of what came out of that. Um, so that was in January. In March, you might have come across this document, The Age of Artificial Intelligence, and this is a, this is a document that was published uh, that sort of sets out, um, I suppose, the initial part of the, of the EU strategy on human-centered AI. Um, in April, you might have seen a thing called the, the European Commission communication on AI. If you haven't read this, I'd, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, this is a document that pretty much sets out what the Commission are going to be doing in artificial intelligence. Um, and so, you know, very, very big numbers of things that are, um, in terms of investment and in research and so on. And I think um, one of the things we've, done, we've tried to do in your AI is make sure that we're at the table with, uh, with the Commission. And so we um, we are meeting very regularly and, uh, in fact, probably in, in weekly communication with them now, which is, uh, which is great for the association. Um, so just going back to this report that we worked on, or this workshop, um, so just this will give you a sense of the countries that participated. So not every country um, ended up sending a representative, but that's okay. This is not meant to be a, um, a sort of an, well, it's an official document, but it's not meant to be a complete document. So if there's, if there's things that are missing from it, we can certainly add to it. Um, and so a few things that came out of this that, that were interesting, um, I just want to give you a sense of what the, what the um, outcome of this meeting was. So first of all, I suppose we looked at, I suppose, the industry and government, governmental people are very interested in what's happening in terms of startups. And so we, um, we brought in a company called Asgard from Germany to, to, um, to give us a briefing in terms of what's going on in terms of startups. And I suppose, as I said on the panel earlier, what's, what's very interesting is the amount of startup activities going on in the UK and particularly in London. In fact, um, it's almost more than the sum of the next six or seven countries, which is, which is quite amazing. Um, in terms of population, um, like obviously the larger countries you'd expect more activity to be going on. But I suppose what's interesting is when you look at countries by population, um, you know, you see companies like Switzerland and Sweden and Finland sort of coming to the fore, which is interesting. Um, in terms of takeaway messages from the event, and you can download this report and you can read it, I suppose I just want to take you quickly through um, what the group said. And it would be interesting to, to hear whether or not you agree with these sentiments or not. Um, so the, the sort of consensus in the room was that the strategy that, that the Commission is producing needs to be based on a sort of a, an EU-wide 
approach rather than something that's going on in a country by country basis. And you, you'd have heard uh, Khalil Rahana making this point earlier on, and uh, you've heard about the Clare Initiative, for example. There's lots of things going on with this um, with this sense, and the. I suppose the, when, you asked, when we asked the, the group who attended the workshop what the next step should be, the sense was that we should be creating sort of regional clusters uh, that were networked together. And, you see, and this is consistent with what we saw in the uh, communication that came out then in April. And you know, I would like to think that some of the things that the URI members contributed at this workshop would have had an influence on that. Um, so there was a focus on, um, so there was a sense that we shouldn't, that the AI community should be sort of counteracting this sort of negative media characterization of killer robots and you know, dystopian futures and so on. Um, they are, these are important things, but we should be looking at realistic scenarios and try to document those and try to characterize those. Um, and I suppose, you know, things like um, uh, there was broad consensus from the meeting um, that one of the real advantages that Europe has is this very strong academic um, uh, landscape and its, its very strong track record. Um, and I suppose while the Commission would have the view that the AI world in Europe is too fragmented, and I suppose as URAI we would often think of AI as our association, but of course EU Robotics is, is a major part of this and there are a number of other associations, BDV, BDVA, so, that, so when the Commission looks at the landscape of AI, they look at it very broadly, um, more broadly than, than we as URAI members might actually think of, um, of the community. Uh, so that's something interesting and I suppose it, it was noted that the academic community itself is probably the community that tries to integrate across Europe, which is, uh, which is interesting. Um, there was a concern, again, voiced by many people, um, I suppose two things, this sort, of this sort of, not brain drain necessarily, but this sort of tendency that European researchers are doing great things in China and the US, but not tending to do them here in Europe, uh, was very much a message that came out of that workshop. Um, as well as things like um, challenges around access to open data and so on, which obviously the BDVA is, a, is, a, is heavily involved in. Um, the, so, in terms of, um, so Max Tegmark in his talk today was talking about the uh, ban on lethal autonomous weapon systems. And again, what was interesting about, the, about this workshop is that very, very strongly, almost unanimously, uh, there, was support, th there was the view that AI should not be used for uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems. And so there was, there was considerable support, not only from the URAI members, um, organizations that were um, uh, member associations, but also from the governmental representatives and industry representatives, which was interesting. Um, and I suppose there was a sense that, um, that uh, you know, we should really be developing and focusing on AI as, a, as something for... Um, that we're designing, in some sense, the, uh, the economy of the future and the, and the, and the world of the future for, for future generations. Um, so in, t in terms of next steps, um, the sense from that meeting was that uh, there should be, obviously, I suppose the business people were very interested in entrepreneurship and hackathons and all this sort of stuff. Um, the concept of a CERN for AI was certainly mentioned, um, and this idea of a distributed um, AI uh, network of high-end centers was something that was um, very much emphasized. Uh, there was a sense that, that European governments should be working together much more aggressively in terms of AI. And um, in April, in fact, on, the, um, on Digital Day, the member states, well, most of the member states, and I believe all of them at this point, have signed a, a cooperation agreement on artificial intelligence. So, so if you don't know this, your government has, has already signed up to an agreement that commits them to spending more money on artificial intelligence research. So um, if you haven't got a copy or you can't find a copy of this agreement, send me an email and I'll send you a copy of that statement. Um, with, the, with the signature of your local minister who said they were going to do this. So hold them to that. Um, and I suppose the, uh, the, there was significant interest in uh, the idea of, of infrastructure around integrated data and so on for Europe. Um, incentivizing collaboration was a, bi was a big issue. Um, obviously the whole training piece, uh, education, summer schools, we should be doing more of that and there should be more funding for it. And, uh, and I suppose outside of the, um, 
outside of the academic community, there's also the question of, you know, how do we rescale and upscale people who are in careers today but want to be, um, want to learn something about AI. So, um, I think from my point of view, it's kind of refreshing that most of the things I would have expected people to say, people were saying. Um, there, was a few, there was a few points in here that um, were new, but I would be very interested in hearing, um, you know, over the next number of weeks, what your view is of this. Um, would be, this, is all, this is all on the AI Alliance portal, so you'll pick it up there and you can comment on it uh, as much as you wish. Um, basically more money. Uh, people were strongly supporting that. Um, I suppose significant, there was, there was a lot of interest in people studying sort of scientifically how, um, how, society, how that integration between society and AI should work and what the sort of societal impacts of AI should work, what, what kind of social contracts we should be having um, and uh, you know, an idea to build stronger relationships between uh, industry, SMEs and so on. So uh, all good stuff, I think. So um, that, that's basically a summary. So if, if you want to find this, uh, if you Google the European artificial intelligence landscape, you'll find that page and that report is there that you can, you can, you can download. It's, it's pretty short. It's just essentially a, um, uh, a recording uh, in text of some discussions and debates and summaries from each of the member states. Thank you. I'm going to hand you back to Cecile, who's going to... Uh, ah, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And now uh, we will have a presentation uh, from the president of the Big Data Value Association. Okay, Laure Lebas will present you up. Yes. You can use it. Thanks. Good afternoon. It's quite uh, almost good evening now. Uh, so I will, uh, this, uh, this uh, presentation is pretty complete. I will uh, just stop on a few uh, slides that are important for us. So I'm, I'm uh, the president of BDVA, but I'm also working for SAP Research. And those, uh, uh, this association is, is the private part of this partnership with, with the Commission uh, as part of this uh, Horizon 2020 program. So uh, you will see also EU robotics. But uh, here I want to give you a sense of what we do in general, but more specifically uh, what our, uh, our view and our activities in AI and what we see for the future. So first this is, uh, I will not go on each uh, point, but this is uh, an overview of the mission from, from, uh, of the association. So of course one of the biggest one is to develop the ecosystem. So here we speak about um, uh, large and, uh, industry and SMEs, but also uh, research, academics, and all kind also of association who have to say something on, on the, the data and on the value on, the, on those data. Uh, of course, we cover things like uh, standards, ethical, so, societal uh, aspect, skills, and, and, and knowledge is very important. I mean, everybody knows that we know, need more and more of those uh, data scientists. And all in all, I mean, innovation is certainly uh, one important part. Uh, just quickly, so it's an association, as I said, European, uh, non-for-profit, non uh, roughly 40% uh, of academic and research uh, uh, as a partners, uh, a good half of industry, 20% uh, of those being large industry and a lot of SMEs. So just to give you a hint of um, where do we come from? So, of course, we have a, a good representation in West uh, Europe. We try to do uh, to have more and more in East Europe, but that's for historical reasons. Um, so, uh, I mentioned the skills, the legal aspect. Uh, uh, of course, we touch also um, the, the technology, so all the different aspects of, of uh, technologies, including AI. Uh, application as well. This is the difficulty of this association. We kind of cover all the vertical, the horizontal, etc. But uh, more or less all industries are represented uh, in this association. Uh, uh, I'm talking about domains, application. Uh, also, when we talk about uh, technology industry, uh, uh, software, hardware aspect are represented. So it gives uh, us a good um, a good, uh, uh, we cover 
more or less uh, all aspects of this, uh, uh, and we can uh, develop this uh, such uh, strategic research and innovation agenda, which you can read uh, on site. I will not go through it. Uh, here it's another view, so, uh, uh, so where to represent the interaction, so what we do inside BDVA, so we have different task forces or, or working group. So on the left, bottom left, for example, you see different uh, uh, data technologies so from a technical point of view. Uh, on top, uh, in verticals, it's a few examples of the, of the um, industry we are mentioning. And external, between courts, you see uh, the, the collaboration we may have. So specifically on a artificial intelligence and, and decision making, uh, we collaborate with different PPPs, so EU robotics being one of these. Uh, but we, I mean, this is much more than just uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this collaboration. Uh, here it's, uh, we'll not go through it, but it's another view of what we do internally and different task forces. I go through it. So here it's uh, um, yeah, another aspect, so same way. Uh, you have on top uh, the different uh, uh, domains. It doesn't mean that every domain is here represented. Uh, what I wanted to point out is that we talk about open data, of course, but also personal data and also private data. Private meaning industry data. So it's uh, the B2B, where, as Cecil mentioned earlier, uh, Europe is pretty strong in, in this aspect. So it's, uh, uh, we should not forget those. So we try to uh, we have all those different interests inside the association. We try to, to at least come to a common view of uh, maybe not interest, but at least exchange on those aspects. And, okay, uh, we don't have a fit for all, but at least we, we exchange on this and we see the pro and cons and the, the, the challenges on the, from the different aspects. Research data, of course, I mentioned it uh, earlier, but that's, that's important for us as well. Um, yeah, okay, that's another view. What I wanted, uh, yeah, it's, the order may not be the, the one I wanted, but this uh, just a, a, a quick overview of, uh, there is a PPP, it's part uh, of, uh, of this uh, collaboration, and uh, we have today 32 projects, there will be another 15 or so uh, announced uh, in two weeks from now, we'll start in, in January. And uh, uh, there is a CSA uh, over, over, I mean, trying to coordinate uh, some of those projects. Uh, and here we talk about technical projects as well as uh, large-scale pilots. And, and as of today, we have uh, bioeconomy, uh, transport, mobility and logistics, healthcare, and smart manufacturing. This is the four that are running today. We will have more uh, later on, but just to give you a span of, of what we, we cover here. Uh, here is just a quick overview, uh, I mean, beside this, uh, um, ha uh, I mean, um, yeah, pi pilot or, or large-scale uh, project I wanted to, to phrase, from the beginning BDVA uh, uh, started with this concept of innovation space. Um, so back in 2014 when we set up uh, the association, the idea was it's not just only a physical platform to, to put data and, and work on it. it. It is this, but uh, not only. Uh, it was really to create an ecosystem where SME get access to technology exchange on different aspects, not only legal associated, but also uh, uh, business models, for example, etc. Uh, so we defined, we already have several high spaces were represented at, at, at BDVA, so uh, Smart Data Innovation Lab in Germany, um, Terra Lab in France, uh, Cineca in Italy, etc. I don't want uh, to forget any. Uh, and each of these innovation space may not cover all aspects. Huh? We may have, so SDIL, for example, is very strong on research. Uh, uh, on, on, uh, on data, uh, we may have others who, who are, uh, who are more working on, on specific application, etc. Uh, but the, the intent of all of this is really to create this ecosystem, give access to SMEs. So that's that's important. So this we still work on this. Uh, it was, I mean, some of those uh, projects are 
kind of reflecting this concept. The digital innovation hub is definitely something that goes well together. Uh, in iSpace, we concentrate on the data, but I mean, it, it, it goes together. It's not antinomic. Uh, Okay, so that's, that's just a list of those. So that's uh, the criteria. I will pass this. Um, I will pass this as well. I would like to go. Yeah, here it's just, uh, I mean, before that it was the different aspect of the vision. Uh, here I just want to, to uh, point uh, specifically on what we do in AI. So we, we, we are working on this, I mean all partners are, are separately working on this anyway, but we produce several vision papers, position paper, we organize several workshops internally, I mean among BDVA members, but also together with the other association, with the commission, there will be more to come. Uh, next one is uh, September 19th in Brussels, we will have, uh, um, so we have several workshops at different other event, I mean, uh, uh, we take the occasion of those. Uh, same way we have uh, the European Big Data Val Value Forum will be, will be this. And by the way, the title of this, uh, so European Big Data Value Forum is the event organized, co-organized by BDVA and the Commission. Um, and the title of this year is Data Driven AI for the Future. So, you know, this is central for us. Uh, last year was Trusted AI for Smart Industry. So we, we are still in the same topic. So this is definitely really important for us. Uh, and of course, when you talk about Data Innovation Hub, we are here. I mean, we, we see uh, how is it related, etc. Of course, I mean, uh, I should have started with that, but you, you, we do AI, we talk a lot about AI today uh, because we have the data and we have the, the, the power of the computer. So it's not, it, it goes together. I mean, this, uh, we don't do data, big data for the, the sake of doing big data. Uh, yeah, and of course, all those uh, technical challenges that, that appear here are, uh, are also uh, discussed. Um, this is all the type of activities. So, of course, we have also collaboration with HPC, and we, we, we came back to the same, uh, same point as well. Uh, here, it's another view of the different collaboration we have, but I don't have to go through it. And um, I will finish with this. So, I mentioned it, this European Bit Data Value Firm. So, I give you, uh, I invite you to come to Vienna on November 12th to 14th. Will be plenty of keynote sessions. Uh, and workshops uh, will be a more, uh, uh, you know, really uh, uh, practical, uh, and uh, several will cover definitely uh, AI. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And last but not least, our uh, PPP on robotics, and. Uh, this is a bit where we started with a, a robotics activity where we want to have more intelligent robots, but we need robots. So, Bernd, is it the first? No, no it must the be the last one. So, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for staying. Even if it's late in the evening, listening a little bit to robotics. I uh, would like to start with the statement, robotics needs AI and AI needs robotics. I think at the end of the, of the small presentation, we will understand and we hopefully agree. Um, giving you an insight about EU robotics, EISPL, it's an organization with a little bit more than 250 members uh, all over Europe the uh, largest network of roboticists and business in Europe was uh, the conjunction of the Euron and the Europe network from academia and industry, which means we have 50-50 uh, 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 academia and, and uh, industry. Uh, we have more than 30 topic groups, uh, grassroots uh, talking shops covering wide range of robotic-related uh, issue, including AI for sure, and uh, a successful collaboration. Uh, and after a couple of years now, uh, after a couple of years in training between academia and industry. Uh, together with uh, the uh, European Commission, 
uh, we are in the, uh, the, the private uh, part of the uh, PPP Spark, uh, responsible for the uh, 700 million uh, funding from the EU plus additional 2.1 billion from industry. I think you already saw these numbers in the presentation before, but uh, the outcome of uh, Spark are two important documents. It's the strategic research agenda and the multi-annual roadmap. Uh, which you could download and it gives you an idea what our strategy is to make uh, European a pretty, uh, Europe a pretty strong, uh, strong place for robotics and uh, how the, the roadmap uh, should look like. Talking about AI, and that was a little bit our fear uh, in the past, that always means, okay, it's a lot of software, it's a lot of big data, it's a lot of mathematical algorithms, but the question is, what happens if physics and, and mechatronics gets into the game? And uh, the, 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 the question I got from the commissioner a couple of years ago was, what's uh, the European robotics standing for? And that, that's hard to answer. If you take a look on, on, on the US side, very often you get uh, confrontated with the statements, okay, uh, US robotics, that's uh, medical robotics, that's this famous Da Vinci uh, surgery system. If you take a look on Japan, you get the humanoids, but the question was, what's Europe standing for? And we are in a lucky position that uh, we have many, many uh, robot manufacturers, especially in the uh, um, area of, of service robotics. Uh, giving you a number, we have a little bit more than uh, 50 industrial robot manufacturers worldwide. We have 675 service robot manufacturers. And big surprise, one third of these service robot companies are located in Europe, which means not everybody is sitting in the Bay Area. And uh, from the startup scene, uh, um, Europe is on, on, on the front position too. But giving an answer, uh, we discussed a lot within our organization and with the, with the colleagues from the, the, the commission, we agreed on four uh, focus areas or priority application areas, which are agri-food, healthcare, infrastructure and manufacturing. And these four are complex physical workplaces, which makes it very interesting for us in, in robotic, because if you take a look on the, on the uh, industrial side, uh, for example, with the beginning of robotics, introducing them in, in automotive manufacturing, you have a very structured environment and getting more and more into the small uh, facilities with the entrepreneurs, into the startup companies, or on the medical side, uh, into the home care, elderly care robotic stuff, you're getting from structured to unstructured environment, which is, uh, requires a high precision of the robots, uh, dexterity, intelligence for sure, and it's an ongoing discussion on which ranking would you find intelligence. Is intelligence more important than safety? Uh, if the robot is directly dealing with humans or is safety more uh, important? I think that's a discussion uh, which is, is interesting. Robustness and reliability, another topic I think nobody uh, uh, wants to have a, a, a shutdown of a robot within a surgery. Uh, and and uh, from, the, from the automotive uh, training center, everybody, I think, believes that it's, it's a hard task uh, to make the systems run. Talking about these uh, applications, these technologies, we are ending up in an, in an overlap between artificial intelligence, which is, which is not only robotics, but on the other side, robotics is not only uh, 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 artificial intelligence. There is an, an overlap which we call physical AI, and I'm very happy about the presentation I heard this afternoon, uh, getting to the social AI, human-based AI, uh, giving us the hope that not everybody is only uh, powering now into, into the algorithms, into the software, but also taking care about this collaboration of these 
machines, let's say, uh, together with, with humans and solving these problems. For this, we need uh, motion with intelligence, uh, getting supported from the AI community. We need uh, cognitive mechatronics at the end of the day to get to successful uh, and reliable products in, in many new areas. This means uh, there is a, a logic behind the collaboration of, of uh, robotics and AI. Robotics in, the f in, in these focus areas I just mentioned, like healthcare, agri-food, manufacturing, inspection, and maintenance, gives us a uh, 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 um, rich amount of, 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 of data uh, and, and physical data which we could uh, support to the, to the community, which we could uh, get into the uh, AI on demand platform uh, to feed the knowledge bases to, to support the AI technologies, the development coming out of there. And the platform can connect the two uh, uh, areas, as I just mentioned, the, the, the physical AI at the interface between, between the two uh, uh, groups. The goal is that we are creating machines with physical intelligence that support and improve all aspects of, of human life, but as you can mention by yourself, we have to ensure that safety, ethical, and legal constraints are never compromised, and I'm, I'm very happy about the statement I saw before about uh, intelligent uh, weapons. And I think that uh, we agree 100% that, that we have to have uh, uh, self-regulation within our, our, our group to uh, defend ourselves. The next steps which we would like to see is uh, really to, deliver, uh, to develop an AI partnership uh, uh, within the, the, the PPPs delivering a joint strategic roadmap and, and strategic roadmap in our case does not mean that we now want to override the whole work which is done. No, we want to add this physical aspect to the roadmap and we want to have uh, the same, uh, developing on the same language if we are talking about these intelligent within, within our machines and we want to engage with the, with the commission and continue uh, these, these development with uh, uh, workshops. And, and, but I think that's something we already uh, heard from, from the colleagues in the other, in the other presentations. Last but, last but not least, uh, I would like to invite you to the uh, European Robotics Week. Uh, Europe is opening the doors again like every uh, last full week in, in November. Uh, the starting event this year takes place in Germany, in Augsburg. Last year we had it in Brussels, the year before in Amsterdam. Uh, we are pretty proud that uh, Augsburg now gets a chance uh, to invite people and uh, to demonstrate uh, what's possible in, in robotics. Normally, uh, we have more than 1,000 events with up to 50, 60,000 people joining this, which means there's a huge interest, at least it looks like, uh, on the, on the, uh, in, in Europe on, on the topic of, of robotics. And uh, once a year, we have the European Robotics Forum, which the next one takes place in March 2019 in Bucharest. Uh, perhaps and ho hopefully we will get a little bit more AI workshops and discussions like we had uh, 2018 in Tampere, but it's a good chance to continue the collaboration within the different groups. Thanks a lot for listening. Maybe is that working? No. Is it working? Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, just a quick uh, remark. I, I wanted to go quick, and I forgot so to mention something to make the link with uh, Cecil's presentation. Uh, BDVA, for example, is active and, and has a representative, uh, Noza Bujema, at this high um, 
high-level uh, expert group in, in AI, and we do continuously dialogue and exchange with them. So Noza Bujema is from INRIA. Uh, she's director of Data AI Institute. She's also an expert on OECD, uh, et cetera. So there is this international dimension anyway uh, on this aspect. Sorry. So any Give you time to think of the question. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Ronny Wanson. I'm with the Swedish Defense Research Agency. I have a question for the Commission about these uh, innovation hubs, regional innovation hubs. Um, are you expecting some kind of, um, uh, what, what concrete um, effects are you expecting of supporting these innovation hubs? For instance, are you expecting regional universities to develop advanced courses in some certain uh, subject? Or are you also expecting some um, pan-European migration of researchers? Right. The, uh, the focus of uh, digital innovation hubs, it's uh, not uh, fostering research per se. It's to bring the technology to uh, all potential users. But we build, we rely on the investment made locally in the universities, in the research center, because we have to establish the link between the, the knowledge and the, uh, and, and, and the application. But what we do fund is uh, the, the interconnection between the digital innovation hubs to, to, to help the, uh, the complementarity between those. So, uh, no, if, if we want to target research, we, we, we are going to have in, uh, in, the, in the call in 2020 something more targeted to reinforcing research centers. So this is something we still need to elaborate a bit, uh, and, and this is something we are also looking for inputs. So what should we do to reinforce existing research centers? So the focus being more on the research, how to strengthen than or, or, or quality of research, how to bring an EU value, added value in, in making, helping them to collaborate, which new mechanism should we put in place to make that happening? So, so already existing research centers? Already existing research centers. We could also, if there is a need to create new ones, so this is also something to be discussed, so that, that's uh, any any uh, good ideas to, uh, to, to really keep Europe uh, in the front are interesting and we would consider. What they did in China is, is really work closely together, governments, I mean, it's much more government driven and pushed, uh, but uh, yeah, bringing the different elements, the industry, the, the government and the, uh, and the academia together. Uh, so, so the approach is quite different, uh, but, but uh, what we can learn from what exists is also uh, really to bring what we have already and, and we have a lot and uh, it's, it's, it's really to capitalize on all this and, and, and we need to bring people together and this the problem is is many of the results are there and left unexploited so what can we do to, to make the bridge between okay all these results standing there and, and not used so, so can we, can we build on that? And can we also help the researchers so that when a new researcher comes, does not have to start from scratch again and can capitalize on, on previous results? So this is why we try to help in, in, in making these common resources and, and try to, to, to build this resource and, and bring things together. There is no magic solution, and if there is, uh, if you have good ideas, so the one one of the the uh, uh, the big activity in the AI on demand platform will be to be to do community building as well. So uh, you will have to interact with them and see how you can also help them uh, to to make it better and faster and more efficient. Thank 
you. Uh, hi, I have two questions. Uh, one of them I will ask you um, personally later. Uh, and the first question, uh, I'm asking about the uh, calls uh, in the European Commission. And I'm asking uh, which of the calls, in which uh, calls the um, Iranian professors uh, could be the lead participant and in those uh, calls that the Iranian professors could be the lead, uh, if um, being the lead from Iran or Europe um, make any difference for the acceptance of the project because there are uh, less um, proposals from Iran, uh, if uh, being lead from Iran would increase the acceptance rate of the proposal or no, <laughs> or if my European um, partner being the lead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the program is open to, to all the countries, but we, we fund uh, only Europeans, uh, unless there is an exceptional, uh, for instance, expertise, which is not in Europe, and then there is an exception. But, but in, in the, 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 the idea is, yeah, to, to be open, but fund uh, the, the Europeans. So, so this is... Um, uh, the, the, the principle of the. Uh, so did I answer correctly? To lead, uh, that I don't think is the case. To lead, yeah, it's it's uh, as as a partner is possible, but to be to be checked. We never had the case in our calls, uh, but but from what I remember, it's uh, it's not possible to lead. It's, it's okay to participate, but uh, not to lead. And actually, it's, it would be also an advice to give. It's it's to join a group, because we, we fund consortia, uh, to join a group which has already an experience in developing a proposal because it's, it's extremely demanding to develop a proposal. So as a first time uh, in, a pro in a project, it's better to join an existing group rather than trying to build from scratch. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Patrick Florian from Helsinki. Uh, Professor O'Sullivan made a very strong uh, point in the panel before the coffee break of uh, funding basic research uh, and uh, now I was listening to the Commission uh, representative's presentation about the new instruments uh, after 2020 and it was very much about exploitation. So could you maybe elaborate a little bit about uh, how much uh, extra money uh, the Commission will put into basic research in AI? Right. Uh I, I made a point about this exploitation program because it's a new thing. So it's something we're uh, trying to, to, uh, to sell, to convince the people it's good to invest on. But it doesn't mean that we will stop doing the rest. So, so I insisted on, on the new thing. But we will continue definitely to fund uh, basic research. The ERC will continue and, and uh, future and emerging technology will continue. So, so we don't want to stop that. We know how important is it. I cannot give you right now the uh, increase of funding in that area that, that I don't have this value, uh, but, but it, will, it, will, it will come and uh, yeah, to, to be more specific in those, th this will be elaborated over the year. By the end of this year, we will have more, more precise information, uh, but, but the point is taken. Don't worry, we will continue doing research. Thank research. you. Yes, hello, Rebecca Wagner from AWTH Aachen University. Um, do you have any suggestions for doing transdisciplinary research? Because a lot of the questions are cross-disciplinary. There's big data sets sitting in the humanities, for instance, where there's no computational power to process that data, but they would be extremely useful for AI. What's the best way to construct and submit a transdisciplinary project? Hmm. Uh, yeah, you really have to look into the various calls, but there might be some which are uh, which are helping in that. Uh, there, in, yeah. uh, there are some technical calls. I mean, those, uh, yeah, on, on, on those specific aspects. But, but in, in, in the robotics call, we had quite a lot of multidisciplinary by essence, because yeah, in robotics is, is also the, the science of integration the different, the, of the different aspects. So we have covered yeah, life science and, and in, in our call also on cognitive, say, uh, on cognitive systems, uh, yeah, we had a lot of different uh, disciplines. So, so 
we recognize that it is important to have the multidisciplinary aspect. It's even part of the evaluation uh, uh, criteria. But, uh, yeah, check all the lists there, and there might be already some calls which you could fit on. Otherwise, go to the open call where you can also make the point that it is important because it's acknowledged by the expert, which are your counterpart, that the multidisciplinary aspect is so important. And we see also in, in your uh, PPP this aspect of multidisciplinarity. So, so this is coming and we have to continue pushing for that. There is, this is where there is the value as well.